stakes have been high for a lot of the panels. I feel like I really like laid it on with the title for this one. Uh, <laughs> life, death, justice, and love. <laughs> so um, I'm really, I, um, sadly Mel is unable to make it today. Um, I know. But um, yeah, so we're just going to have three papers and a little more room to breathe, I guess, so, and discuss. Um, and with that, I'm just going to introduce our first speaker, Colin Diane, who is the Robert Penn Warren Professor in the Humanities and Professor of English at Vanderbilt. And she's the author of Fables of Mine, an inquiry into Poe's fiction, Haiti, History, and the Gods, The Story of Cruel and Unusual, and most recently, the fantastic, The Law is a White Dog, How Legal Rituals Make and Unmake Persons, selected as a top 25 outstanding academic book of 2011. She was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Um, I also wanted to note, uh, my introduction to Colin came through an email exchange between Colin and Donna with this really fantastic, is it the Boston Review? I always, what are, Boston yeah, Review. yeah, she's been writing some really neat stuff on breed specific legislation in particular and kind of pitbull politics, easily findable online through the Boston Review, um, just some really fantastic pieces. So. That was how I came to know her, is through our, our shared passion for, um, I think, what you're about to talk about. Okay, <laughs> so. thank you. Well, again, it's, it's, it's wonderful to be here. This has been an amazing, amazing conference. And thank you, Harlan. Um, it is interesting about you know writing for something like the Boston Review when Marilyn decided that they would have breed-specific, not just breed-specific legislation, but strict liability for pit bulls, which of course meant that people who had them would not be able to um, keep them, not because of the insurance costs, but also strict liability means that even if the dog has never bitten, will never bite, just the pit bull type, the appearance, um, they even spoke about the one drop of pit bull blood <laughs> was enough to uh, you know, mean that you are responsible, strictly responsible um, for that dog. So that uh, it's an atmosphere of fear is created. But the interesting thing is that uh, I've had a vexatious, we can talk about this later, but relationship with the Humane Society, uh, uh, given a, a great deal of what I'm going to talk about today in that the Maryland Humane Society did really stand up against this uh, legislation. However, in many cases of alleged dog fighting, uh, even the Vic case, which was not alleged, um, the Humane Society and the ASPCA are often responsible for making the decision and arguing in court uh, that the fighting dogs, allegedly dangerous dogs, once a fighting dog, always a fighting dog, should be put down. So there was a kind of heated exchange between us. But I do think it's important to think about some of these thornier issues in humane care. So I, I'm going to read just a few things from the book that I'm writing now called Like a Dog, Animal Law, Human Cruelty, and the Ethics of Care. Um, the streets of New York are sometimes dangerous if you happen to be black, poor, or a pit bull. The Deep South is sometimes dangerous if you happen to be white, poor, or pit bull. In this catalog, I'm putting in relation humans and dogs in what might seem a tasteless or even racist merging. But the proximity matters. Whenever I turn from academic, literary, or historical context to the lived daily reality of what is happening to the majority of people in this country, I realize that animality is what we need to consider, not claims for the human, an appeal to our attention our attentive and not speculative faculty. Now, a lot of this probably is prepared for in my earlier writing for years about the legal history and practice of slavery and imprisonment in the Americas. I learned that the idea of the beast, or to quote the natural historian of Jamaica, Edward Long, the brute icon of the human, was a category best avoided in racist taxonomies or natural histories of the Caribbean and the American South, as you know. Categorical thinking ushered in boundaries that not only separated humans from animals, but also generated new ideas about what was to count as human. These new taxonomies depended on the rank of animal to embody the slave, a fiction of law that became a moral truth. <coughs> this fantastic amalgam of human, animal, and inanimate thing 
created fantasies that could locate a Guinea Negro in the same category, and I'm quoting Edward Long, as learned horses, learned and even talking dogs. So it is natural to sense the danger of the juxtapositions that I'm going to be making today. But as I just mentioned yesterday, I'm trying to trace a form of ethics that moves beyond dehumanization and beyond the kind of anthropocentric worldview that supports it. So I really want to focus on the oscillation between categories usually kept separate. And as Harlan mentioned, for the past few years, my teaching and research has focused on breed bans, euthanasia, and what I call preemptive justice. And my analysis of extinctions, as Donna was mentioning yesterday, the extinctions that she spoke so beautifully about, um, lays bare the various mechanisms by which certain kinds of humans and dogs, once labeled as expendable, can be sacrificed to the realities of a control that can then easily and lawfully and even humanely be extended to others. So as our world becomes more brutal, or to move closer to home, as our prisons become receptacles not only for that race of men, as Jefferson put it, but for ever increasing numbers of persons considered unfit, we need to consider how life is curbed in various other less obvious zones of exclusion. So I want to take the life, death, and even breath of dogs as my prompt in order to reshuffle our conceptual schemes. I'm not interested in animal rights, giving animals what we think it is we get as bearers of rights and obligations in standard liberal moral terms. Nor do I propose a turn, whether sentimental or caring, to Levi Nas's Bobby or Derrida's cat. Instead, I want to turn to the lives of the dogs and to what remains interstitial, mysterious, and undetermined in this encounter. I am, in fact, endeavoring to seek the meaning of conscience in the life of dogs. My concern is not about larger issues of biodiversity or extinction and the really glaring example that uh, Donna mentioned about the incarnate cruelty and s that is felt. Is it Highway 90? 99. 99 in California. But I do want to turn to labeling and abuse of what I feel is a kind of commonplace animal in our midst, the dogs, and particularly the pit bull. Um, the dog, the pit bull, now straddles uh, the divide. And I'm using the term, as Harlan mentioned yesterday, it's a term that one uses, but of course, if you wanted to identify a pit bull type dog, uh, you would, in the United States, probably identify 70% of the dogs that we see <laughs> as pit bull types. Um, the divide, though, is one that's very interesting, because the divide that this breed calls up is one between feral and domestic, threat and pet. And that is what I mean by the interstitial, that given the pit bull's kind of cameo role in what I think about as our contemporary spectacles of demonism and predation, what Cora Diamond calls sheer animal vulnerability, the fate of the pit bull leads us to a question I want to address. And I mentioned it briefly yesterday. What does conscience look like at the boundaries of humanity? Where the really busy and harsh work of the making and unmaking of human boundary objects takes place. So I'm interested in this recent work of trying in, just in both granular and theoretical registers to try to talk about the invisible nexus of animality, human marginalization, and juridical authority. So, for example, in extending the legal standard of unnecessary suffering in animal law, what would necessary suffering look like? And this is not a philosophical inquiry. I don't attempt to define how and where we draw the line between humans and animals. Instead, I'm trying to contribute to an understanding of how, where, and why human beings quite arbitrarily devise, formulate, and apply lines separating the human and animal, or deliberately blur those lines. Also, in reinterpreting the meaning of human in terms like human treatment, or humanitarian in specific local contexts, I want to make humanity a position marked by a certain kind of relativity and certainty. So the questions I just want to share with you today, and I hope I'll have a chance to talk about this, is like, 
what is the real or particular terrain for human cruelty? Who gets to command its shift in species and race? In other words, who gets to be cruel? And it's kind of impossible to produce um, the necessary elaborations on a brutality that comes before and after all the enlightenments that have sanctioned authority and violence and demand our responsibility. So I want to direct my thoughts to a project that is political. And again, um, in responding to the state of what I'm not exaggerating seems to me of dread, injury, and pain that we confront daily, I want to maybe face or, or put ourselves in proximity with creatures that we might want to cut ourselves off from, not just the dogs, but the men. Um, so let me try to just think about regulatory policies for a moment and the police power that accompanies them. One of the reasons why uh, Vic's dogs and many dogs that are saved from alleged dog fighting or real dog fighting operations are to be killed rather than let remain alive goes back to really a law from the uh, turn of the century, 19th uh, century, where any dog that had fought was allegedly dangerous and could be forfeited to the state. The whole language of forfeiture is very interesting. If a dog is astray, the state has the right to unleash what has by now become kind of familiar practices of discrimination and violence. And this, but this summary disposal of dogs branded as vicious, offensive, or a threat to the public can be traced to early common law and to the range of police measures instituted ostensibly to protect community interests. You know, the Giuliani quality of life stuff. So dogs are liable to extermination if their presence signals disturbance or danger, even if they are not themselves dangerous. As I describe in The Laws of White Dog, by the 1890s, tort cases began to describe, evaluate, and judge the limits of canine injury and death. When can a dog, offensive, and I think the word that we want to think about is offensive, to humankind be legally killed? And what is the nature of the offense? For me, What's fascinating about these early legal cases is the way in which the language of nuisance, the language of outlawry, prepares us for actual categorizations of both the human and non-human animal today, and that the deposits of legality that are in these early cases, that somehow the, the formulae that never go away are fascinating within this idea of abuse of life. So I wanted to just briefly to end by talking about what I mean by juridical subjection. And I keep finding myself going back to a language of faith somehow. There is a way in which I keep thinking about Reinhold Niebuhr, uh, um, what he called the easy conscience of modern man. The way in which you can somehow within the notion of progress, or the idea of a certain kind of progressive move, find yourself um, allowing things to occur that maybe in an earlier time would not have been able to occur, not having that veneer of perfectibility or progress. And I've always been haunted by words like reasonable and the idea of civil consensus. Because I, I do think that there is a certain kind of terminology that I would have to identify um, as very much part of um, our surround that allows the continued dispossession of certain kinds of humans and um, animals. So let me just say one more thing then uh, in closing that the people ask me, why dogs? You know, like, um, why are you concentrating with all these things going on, on the life of, and death of dogs? And it's because I kind of take them as a bridge that joins persons to things, both in our law and legal concepts and in the real world of our daily lives. There's a continuity there, and the dogs, at least for me, form the bridge, and the bridge is what matters. 
because it offers the connectivity between gradations of personhood, and this is the real point, more specifically, a projection of the acceptable or unacceptable citizen. The dog, like its owner, acceptable when domesticated but cast out when wild, is sacrificed to a social picture that depends for its meaning on the division between a polite, rational, civilized, and a violent, savage, and barbaric world. Fear is a vice that takes root. Fear and the brutality that accompanies it can only be recognized when the human and animal are brought together, when what yokes us together as creatures puts us proverbially in the same boat. For the language of threat, removal, and loss, specifically in terms of what happens to a certain breed of dog, has become medium and prompt for the ongoing intimidation, control, and debasement of humans in their turn. And if we were challenged, then, to write a legal history of deprivation, we could go to no better place than the representation of humans when bounded and sharpened by the dog kind. Thank you.